the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we supposed that there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a deal dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. And to verse 40. After leaving the prison, Paul and Silas went to Lydia's home. And when they had seen and encouraged the brothers and sisters there, they departed. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We've done a bit of a funny thing with the text this morning. I wonder if you had to listen a bit differently. Can you hear me? No. no. Here we go, this should be better. Okay. So the rather concise bit that I read of Lydia and her household bookends the high drama that Chuck read of Paul and Silas, the slave girl and the jailer. We hear that the missionaries, Paul and Silas, and others, of course, were all over the place at the time that we find them in Acts. They were doing just as they had been instructed by the Spirit and the elders in Jerusalem, spreading the good news of the gospel, strengthening the church, leaving no stone unturned and no authority figure unagitated. The last one, perhaps an unintended consequence of the job, but I think they rather liked it. They picked up folks along the way, the latest, just before they came to Macedonia, was Timothy, son of a Jewish mother and a Greek father, whom Paul encouraged to join them, and about whom, here's a teaser, we'll hear, we'll hear more next week. Today, we catch Paul and the gang as they cruise through Macedonia, following on a vision he had of a man who asked for them to come and help. They couldn't go on their intended way, which was towards Asia, because according to the text, the Spirit blocked them. So, instead, they went to Philippi. And what a fruitful detour it turned out to be. A slave girl was freed, a jailer was relieved from disaster, a gaggle of magistrates was humiliated, and then there was Lydia. There is much that we can say about Lydia. In fact, there is much that has been said. She was a dealer in purple cloth. Some understand this to mean that she was wealthy. Her household was baptized as she was baptized. Some understand this to mean that she had unusual autonomy and power for a woman at the time. Many assume her to have become the leader of the church in Philippi, highly unusual, of course, and perhaps something to linger on, if just for a moment, that the Apostle Paul, who is said to believe that women should not have leadership roles in the church, is the very same one who baptized Lydia, received her hospitality, wrote that he was encouraged by the deep faithfulness of the community in Philippi as it grew with her leadership. It's curious. Lydia was a worshiper of God, the story tells us. 
Lydia prayed down at the riverside with some other women from the area. Lydia listened. God opened her heart, and Lydia listened. When I was a kid, I dreaded the annual hearing test at school. I can remember now sitting down at a small desk in a small room with this little black box and a set of earphones and usually a woman who would say, it's easy, honey, just listen for the beeps and when you hear them, raise your hand on that side. All would start out well, right side, beep, left side, beep, right side, right side, left side, but then I would notice that she would write something down. Silence. Left side, beep. Silence, right on the paper. Silence, right on the paper. Right side, beep. One year, this time in the school auditorium for such a test, the facilitator fussed at me. You heard it the first time, the same thing. Stop playing games, young lady. I assure you that at that time in my life, I did not play games, <laughs> nor was I happy to fail any kind of test. <laughs> that only got me in trouble, and I had no desire to be in trouble at that time in my life. It turned out after some investigation that my hearing was mildly worse than it should be, emphasis on mildly but enough that I naturally adapted to pay closer attention in conversation. Of course, hearing is different than listening, even when one person has to work a bit harder at the hearing part. Listening requires attentiveness, persistence sometimes. It definitely requires time. And it even requires a capacity for empathy and I think vulnerability. These are all very difficult when it feels like there is no attention to spare, no extra time to give, and it is harder and harder to understand where another person is coming from, particularly when it feels so different than where I am coming from. It is easy to cast stones at the time that we live in for this limited capacity we have to really pay attention to one another, to really want to listen. The energy it takes to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation in person is significantly more than the energy it takes to text periodically or to have an argument on Facebook. Yet. I wonder if one of the reasons we get this story of Lydia is because it has always been a particular gift of time and effort to truly listen. I suspect that there has always been a ready excuse for why it's easier to choose not to. The slave owner's bottom line was threatened they didn't hear a word elsewise. The magistrate's authority was on the line. They could only hear the crowd chanting. What Paul and Silas were saying, they said, were things not becoming of good and law-abiding Roman citizens. Yet in that time, the spirit moved in the heart of Lydia as she heard the words at the riverside one Sabbath morning, and at some point in there, she really began to listen. Now there's a lot, scripture tells us, that the Spirit is able to do by the riverside with folks who are ready to listen. The disciples were called to follow one morning as they stood there ready to cast their nets, the Hebrew slaves were set free there one day when the waters before, parted before them to make a way out of no way. John preached and baptized there, and people flocked to him all the way up to the, to the wilderness from Jerusalem. 
The resurrected Jesus stood there with bread and fish and invited his disciples to join him one last time before sending them out on the mission that now Paul and Silas and Timothy and Lydia were taking up as their own. Lydia listened and her whole household was baptized and she invited everyone over for a party to celebrate. Lydia listened, and the church of Philippi began that very day. Truth is, though, riverside or mountaintop or coffee shop or street side, when we set ourselves to this task of spirit-led listening, it's pretty hard not to expect that something will change. In 1965, Zernona Clayton moved from Muskogee, Oklahoma, where, to her home, to Atlanta, Georgia, to work for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Her initial work was desegregating hospitals, and that was so successful that she was appointed by the mayor at the time to lead the Model Cities program, which was part of Lyndon Johnson's Great Society. As the head of the program, Zernona worked with five different communities and chairpersons of each. When she started her work, she was warned about one of these chair people in particular, Calvin Craig, who at the time was a grand dragon of the Georgia KKK. The first time she met with all of the chair people, one man just gave her the tips of his fingers in a handshake. And she knew that that was Mr. Craig. Over the course of that next year, however, however, Zernona and Calvin talked almost every day. Mr. Craig kept returning to her office in Atlanta, and they would sit and talk and laugh together, always respectfully, she said, and speaking of many different things. In 1968, then, three years after meeting Miss Clayton, Mr. Craig held a press conference to announce that he was leaving the KKK and dedicating his life going forward to, in his words, building a nation in which black men and white men can stand shoulder to shoulder in a united America. Mr. Craig vacillated on this commitment over time, though he ultimately confirmed it. But the impact of his and Zernoda's conversations was lasting. Mrs. Clayton said that she never set out to change his mind, but that Dr. King had once told her, you've got to change a person's heart before you can change his behavior. It takes time to change a person's heart. Dr. King and Miss Clayton knew that the spirit was and is in the job of doing this, however. And though it takes some time, it also takes the effort that we put to it. This is not a story of the civil rights era that we hear as regularly, but I guess, I hope, it's one that repeated itself in many different offices and street corners and church basements over many years. This is the hope that we have. One of the hopes that we have that we and our institutions and our communities can truly change. It seems that again and again and again the most unexpected people at the most unexpected times and places, turn out to be those who the Spirit uses in her work of change. This is a fundamentally hopeful thing for us, for it means that we can be our better selves in relationship to one another. It is a necessary hope, I think, for it means that we can also be part of the work of the Spirit's change. For we know no one is left alone by the Spirit. It is these kinds of conversations, slow and careful and purposeful, that many of you participated in here this spring with our Civil Conversations Project. 
Now, many of you have participated in as FUSE gathers month in and month out. No one is left alone by God's Spirit. No one who is willing to take the risk of vulnerability to her. And the trouble is, the work is taking that risk. Setting aside the excuses, unbinding the chains of self-importance, swallowing our self-righteous dogma, and making room for the possibility that we might be detour detoured from our safe routines for a bit. Especially now. Listening is an act of faith. It is an act of solidarity. It is attentiveness. It is action. Do not be fooled to think otherwise. For we cannot know who another person is and where they come from and what it is that we can do together if we do not allow the Spirit to open our hearts and to truly listen. There is much that people could say about us as the Church of Jesus Christ, and I pray that one of those things 